Hello everybody and welcome back to another Sponge Chat. My name is Jim and I'm the author of Sponge GLT and I'd like to thank you all very, very much for being here again. Uh, for this Sponge Chat, I have a special guest, uh, Harry Waters from Renewable English. I'm sure that, that you've all seen him on, on social media or on his YouTube channel. Um, he's quite prolific on, on, on social media at the moment. Um, he's very much trying to get uh, to have an interview with Greta Thunberg, so I hope that Greta, you hear this, please go speak with him. Uh, in this bunch chat, we got to speak about Harry's, or who Harry is, his motivations for moving into teacher training, and his motivations for trying to make teachers and learners more climate aware, eco-literate in a sense. Um, and so it's really interesting to look at some of the things that he's done and that he's doing. He's got some very interesting projects in, in the pipeline. Um, and we also looked at his advice for teachers that are perhaps thinking about moving into teacher training or becoming more climate aware themselves. Um, really, really sort of great ideas that he's got for, for helping teachers present um, environmental issues in the classrooms. Um, and I, I'm sure that there's definitely something that all teachers, not only teachers looking to move into teacher training, but teachers who are looking to become more climate aware, um, can take from this sponge tap. So without further ado, let's get into it. If you do like this video, please remember to give us a like, a thumbs up, uh, and to subscribe. Uh, we have a few more sponge chats coming out uh, for July and August, and then I'll be taking a short break. Um, but uh, until then, I hope you enjoy, and I'll see you for the next one. Okay? Bye. Hi, Harry. How are you doing? I'm very well, thanks, Jim. Thank you for having me. Mate, thank you for being here. It's an absolute pleasure to have you. And uh, I just want to say thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to be here. Um, I mean, people are obviously, obviously you're, you're quite sort of prolific in social media, so everyone's, uh, everyone's probably heard of you by now. Um, I'm not sure if that's a compliment or not. <laughs> no, definitely <laughs> it is. It is. It is. I think your message is really, really important. Hopefully we get to sort of expand on that today. Um, I suppose before we get into the sponge chat, maybe we can look at sort of the purpose why we're here. Um, you know, this is all started with a question, really. Uh, you know, how did I move into teacher training? And I got to, it got me thinking. Well, this is how I did it, but I, I know other trainers, materials developers, the way they've got into their positions is is vastly different depending on on, on who you ask, right? Um, and so, so one of the reasons for doing this is to try and give teachers and in insights into how they could develop further uh, in their career within EOT. So that one, that we, we keep them within EOT um, and two, we don't lose them to, for example, mainstream education or at worst, just we lose them completely. Um, and the second one is to try and increase the professionalism in our industry, uh, hopefully by encouraging more development and, and, and teachers to, to take on more opportunities. Um, we can, you know, Get the professionalism up there. That's what I'm hoping. Um, so, without further ado, let's let's take a look at Harry. Who, maybe we can start with who is Harry. Uh, we'll go for we'll, we'll go there, a big sort of deep question. Uh, I like that one. Um, um, who is Harry as a teacher, as a professional, or who is Harry in general? Well, we'll start with a little bit of personal and then professional. How Excellent. Okay. So, who is Harry? Harry is a, a tall, bearded, bald now. Um, father of one lovely young daughter, husband of one lovely young wife. Um, I live in Seville, well, on the outskirts of Seville. Sounds like an FCE answer, that one, doesn't it? I live in a small village on the outskirts <laughs> of Seville, a stone's throw from the Stadio Olimpico. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I've lived in Spain now for just over a decade. Um, wow. I, I love it here. I also hate it here, but you know, that's you know, <laughs> various bureaucratic reasons behind that. Although I must say the most recent uh, bureaucracy I've had has been pretty good. Um, all of the, the Brexit, getting my new card and stuff like that's been really easy. Yeah. So no, I, I am super grateful to, to be able to live here. I love it here. And it's here where I really discovered my, I don't know, my calling, I guess, at first as a teacher and then further down the line as as other things so that's a bit of the personal i right, think i've yeah. segued nicely there 
nice. the yeah. professional. You, you definitely have. Maybe we should. Maybe we can take it from there. Uh, professional Harry. Who's professional Harry? Professional Harry. Um, professional Harry is mostly the guy that you mentioned, who's on uh, on social media constantly. Um, <laughs> I'm sure Greta Thunberg has, has, has uh, she must have seen your messages by now. She maybe. must have. It's day 100 tomorrow. So fingers crossed she's seen them. Um, <laughs> professional Harry is a teacher, first and foremost. Um, professional Harry has been teaching for, like, he's also become Caesar all of a sudden. Um, professional, <laughs> I'm a teacher, first and foremost. <laughs> I love teaching. Um, it's something that I think from about, I don't know, seven or eight minutes into my first class, I was like, this is good. This is good. You know, I'm a frustrated actor. So this is a place where I can perform. No, I'm joking, of course. Um, but yeah, I, I absolutely love teaching. I love helping other people. I love helping people achieve their goal and, you know, helping them along the way with that. And with language learning, I think it's, it's, it's just perfect for it. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of my, the first thing. And from that, I'm also a teacher trainer, um, like yourself. Again, I think that stems from the kind of helping people side of things. You know, mm. I love to be able to impart knowledge. You know, you mentioned, um, you, well, your chat, your, your blog is sponge. You know, people are sponges for knowledge. Um, and I like trying to share that knowledge. Yeah. That's something yeah. I really love about ELT in general as well. It is a very sharey kind of community. You know, mm. it's all about you know, listening to each other and sharing with each other. And if you see somebody using your ideas, I don't know, it gives you such a wonderful feeling that, oh, yeah. look, they're using that plan. They're using that idea. They're using that game. They're using that activity. Yeah. Um, I think that's quite rare within a lot of like communities. You know, it's, you know, I don't know. People kind of look at it as more of stealing, but I like, I like it when people steal my stuff. Yeah, and I yeah. like it when they adapt it and make it their own. And you can see within somebody else's work, like, oh, that's like what I did, but it's got a twist on it. And I know with like, a lot of the sessions I've done, a lot of the sessions I do, like when it's you get the feedback from people in, in the audience and people who are attending, and they have another take on it and another idea of it. And that's something I love about teacher training is your ideas just expand. They just grow and grow and grow. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's my, my trainery side. And then I'm also a content creator. So I, I create content and I write materials, um, which I think that's fairly self-explanatory. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, and, and, and that's generally for the, in terms of the content uh, creation that that's predominantly for your YouTube channel and for, and, and for I mentioned social media posts, right? Yeah, so well, for, for me personally, it's for, for, see if I can get this right for renewable English um so I create obviously my own content for renewable English which is a climate change awareness um free climate change awareness online course which of course is available on YouTube um and uh renewableenglish.com um so all the content I create for that obviously um the first series was all about expanding on textbooks and and trying to include a bit about the climate in every class but I also do it for obviously for speak up for sustainability mm -hmm. um, which is a, a course I'm working on at the moment for with Pearson and BBC Studios um, and I've done a bit of content curation for various other um, publishers here and there and little bits yeah. and pieces so um, it's, it's mostly sustainable content um, but otherwise you know the the other content I create tends to be more kind of teacher trainery content and right. you know blog writing and stuff like that yeah excellent we mentioned before um coming on today that you that you do have a blog but it's from perhaps a while ago but it seems that there's quite a lot of interesting stuff in there and uh from your sort of your thoughts as a trainer um so definitely i'll, I'll put a link in for people to have uh, have a look at that. absolutely yeah i mean there is a blog for renewable english but you know it's it's I'm not as proficient as you with, with my blogging. Um, I don't, you know, I'm, I, you know, I'm going to bow down to one of the masters of it because uh, you are excellent. Um, and I am looking forward to seeing, seeing one of your talks when I can, um, because I do need to kind of get back more into that. Like personally, you know, I do a lot of professional for, for other, um, for publishers and so on and so forth. I do quite a lot of right. blogging for them, but I want to get back onto the renewable English side of things so um yeah no, you will very, be my cool. inspiration you will be yes. my guiding light I like it I like it um 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think I was speaking a few Spanish chats ago, uh, you know, sort of the motivations to get into blogging. Um, I mean, mine was sort of just that I had these ideas post Delta and I was like, I just want to share these ideas. And then it sort of, to, I mean, I don't even know what it, what it is now. It's, it's a blog, YouTube channel thing. Um, and it's just, it's just gone there. I mean, what were your motivations for it's the fluency facilitator is, is, is the, the blog. So, I mean, back then, what, what were your motivations for starting the blog? Yeah, well, that was, so I was, I'd been in Seville for maybe a year and a bit. Mm. I think it was my second year here in Seville now. So I came to Spain. I first went to Cordoba for a year. Um, I originally planned to stay for a year and then go to Mexico because I was in my travel phase. Right. Um, well, I, I got really sick. Um, don't worry, it's all okay now. But I, you know, Spanish social security uh, took amazing care of me. Um, but I needed medication after that mm. and I couldn't get it anywhere else. So I was like, well, I guess I'm staying here then. <laughs> um, and I came to Seville um, and luckily I met my wife. At the time, she wasn't my wife, obviously. Um, she started out as my girlfriend, later became my wife. Um, so I met her and we kind of, we found our place. And, you know, we were teaching together at this, uh, an academy called The English House. And um, I worked pretty well with the, with the owner, the director, and she, she promoted me pretty quickly to be like a kind of a trainer. Mm. Um, that was like my first steps into training. And she encouraged me to go and speak at conferences and stuff like that. And I was like, brilliant. Well, I've got all these ideas. I need to put them somewhere. You know, I can't just keep doing this because, you know, I'll, I'll eventually get back to it and be like, well, where's that gone? You know, so yeah. uh, you know, I was like, what can I do? I'll, I guess I'll put them into a blog because when I'd been traveling before, I had like a, a personal stream of consciousness blog. So that was kind of the, the start of that. And whenever I came up with an idea or an activity, like my teacher training is almost always like practical based. Mm. Now I like, when I go to a conference, what I like to have is my next two weeks of lessons planned for me. You know, right. I like to be able to walk out of there like, got it all. I've got games, I've got activities, I've got worksheets, I've got a lot. So that was, that kind of shaped my idea of how I wanted to be a trainer. So right. all of my, all of my sessions have, like a huge number of practical elements that you can just slide into your class. Nice. Um, so that was kind of the start of it back in about, I think it was about 2012. So a long, long time ago. Wow. That's a long time ago. I still remember. Yeah. Um, so I started it back then and then I kind of, I, I'd worked on it quite hard for maybe a couple of years. And then I went in, I worked in a state school and I worked in various other places and, and the idea is kind of, they didn't dry up exactly, but they didn't flow as easily. And, you know, I, I had more work at school. So it was only then when I had a really good idea that I'd put it into the, the yeah, blog. Yeah. So, so the first ones, there are some like all right ideas. And then later on, it's like only the kind of the star ideas that I'd put in there. Yeah, um, yeah. But it wasn't, it's not a really cared for blog. Um, it's one of those ones, it's got plenty of ideas in there, lots of stuff, but it wasn't, it wasn't something that I really ever planned on being yeah fair enough. thing it was like yeah, yeah, yeah. a place to record my ideas so yeah it's interesting um, to look at the different sort of uh, what blogs turn out to be whether it's simply just you know putting your ideas down where it's promoting work and things like that um and uh i mean i i would highly recommend any teacher to do it just even if it is for writing your thoughts down you know as a personal stream of conscious blog even if even if it is that um i find i mean for me personally i find it useful uh, for, for a number of different reasons um and of course now obviously with your website I imagine that takes the majority of the time for a new for, for renewable uh, english um perhaps we, we we've spoken about your motivations about blogging but let's let's focus then for example on on your motivations first of all for teacher training and then we'll look at sort of renewable english after that what were your motivations i mean you said that you got promoted quite quickly into that um is that something that, that you wanted to do to move into teacher training or you know was it something that just happened and you went from there um yeah I, I, I mean I went to I went to Athea in I think it was 2011 and I saw Simon Perlman speaking um mm. and his it was all it was supposed to be about drama um in the class in, in a kid's classroom 
Uh, and I can remember it like a vivid, vivid memory of it. Like it, there wasn't a lot about drama in the classroom, but he <laughs> was so passionate. And I was just like, this is great. I love what he's saying. Cause like he agreed with it. It was all about, you know, ideas behind why he likes the idea of drama in the classroom, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And I saw that and I was like, that's really good. And then I went to another session that I got loads of ideas from. I was like, that was really good. And like, the feeling I got coming out of the sessions, I, they were really useful. That was really helpful. I was like, I want to do that. You know, I want to help people. I want to be able to go in and give people a week's worth of lesson plans just in their hand and they can go back and just be done and then think, that was great. That guy really helped me. That was, that was nice. Yeah. Um, and not have the feeling of when, and I know a lot of people are kind of almost forced into going to conferences as part of their contract. You know, you have to go. So you see quite a lot of bleary-eyed ELT teachers kind of wandering around there, you know, on Saturday morning, just like, oh, they've been out on the Friday. Like, I want these people to be excited about coming. And yeah. another reason was I didn't really like my Friday meeting that we had. Um, you know, probably one in five of the Friday meetings. They were obligatory Friday training sessions probably one in five of them was actually useful. Yeah. So I wasn't a huge fan of it. So when my boss said, I want you to take charge of the Friday meetings, I was like, yes, they're all going to be useful. They're all going to have something good in them. Now, I'll be honest, they probably weren't all useful. Um, <laughs> you know, trying to come up with a brand new idea every week is pretty difficult. I mean, you know yourself, when it comes to, when it comes to training sessions, coming up with one a week is probably a bit too many. Um, I think maybe, you know, one a month, that'd be all right. You know, one every couple of months, no problem at all. But yeah, it was, so it, it got a bit much, but it, it did mean I had loads of ideas um, yeah, yeah. and just loads of different ways of developing training sessions. And, you know, those days when I only had one idea and I could go in with it and then, you know, bounce off all the other people in there. And I just, I absolutely love that environment of mm. when you've got a whole bunch of teachers in a room together and they're all just coming with their ideas. And I also love that, you know, there's always that one person who's, I don't know, they'd like to make things perhaps a little more difficult than others. I like that challenge. I like that challenge of when someone comes in and they're like, no, but that's, that's not pedagogically correct. It's like, no, maybe, maybe it isn't. Um, but you know what, if the students are having fun, the students are probably learning from it. So a lot of my kind of training ideas come from that, that basis of, I want the students to be enjoying themselves. So yeah. Yeah. a lot of the activities and ideas that, that I come up with come from something that I do, something that I would do, something that yeah. you know, I do you know, with my friends. You know, I, I play Patank with a good friend of mine Extreme Patank, sorry. It's not regular Patank. We're not old men, you know. We're... What What on earth is Patank? <laughs> Extreme Patank. Extreme um, Patank. <laughs> Patank is like ball or um, it's the game where you've got the big metal ball and you throw a smaller ball. It's like, okay. a, bit like a bit like lawn bowls as you'd have in Australia, but, yeah. you know, better. Um, <laughs> an Extreme <laughs> Patank is when you do it in places that aren't on the Patank court. Okay. Um, but he's also a, he's also a, a teacher. Um, we did a talk together at TESOL Spain, um, all about zooming around and like ideas and games for the Zoom classroom. Brilliant. And it's it's great. It's like you know, we we bounce off each other. We have a similar like ideas for teaching, mm. and we just like come up with games and then we'll play them together. Like yeah. and then we'll we'll find a way to adapt it to the classroom. So I don't know. It it seems something that I was naturally kind of destined to do like do teacher training because I don't know I just I really I really loved it like from the first session that you I know I got that position and from that first session you know that that ability to help people mm. like, make their lives easier that's something everybody needs someone to make their lives easier okay um, nice you know you, you, I'm sure you understand this yourself with you know with the teacher training when there is that kind of you know, light bulb moment and you can see those teachers and you can see in them that they love that idea and they're going to use that idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Um, I think, you know, my role as a trainer, very similar in, in, in that sense, you know, providing ideas, but it's also uh, for me, you know, it's helping teachers look at what they've already got and, and understanding what they're doing 
And I, I, I have to echo um, Chris Rowland's sort of comments here. It's seeing that, you know, that, sorry, my, my Alexa Echo is speaking to me. Very oh, excellent. <laughs> Echo, is, be quiet. <laughs> is Alexa looking for Chris Rowland? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently. Um, no, it's sort of that, that sense of catharsis that teachers have of, you know, after having a session where either it's presenting them with ideas or looking at their context and, and they say, okay, that's, you know, I'm doing that right, or I'm doing well in that and, and, and helping them succeed in their, in their classes. And at the end of the day, making learners successful, right? So, um, but I mean, teacher training doesn't come without its challenges. And I imagine you've, I mean, you mentioned a, a few already. You mentioned coming up with new ideas for workshops um, and sometimes dealing with odd people or difficult people, we'll, we'll try and say it nicely. Um, are there any others, other sort of uh, challenges that, that, that you've come up uh, against as, as a trainer that really stick out? Um, well, it, there's those, I mean, the technological moments you have in, in your training sessions, um, we've all had them. And I think now more than ever, that everything is technological. Yeah. Um, you know, you, your mic isn't working or your Zoom doesn't connect. The other day I had a, a Zoom meeting with, with a, a few teachers and it just it just wouldn't work. It just it wouldn't load. It wouldn't let me in. And I was like, this this isn't okay. Like this isn't cool. So we had to, you know, go out and go in through Teams, like through a different like. And I was just like, well, that was annoying. You know, we've already lost half an hour of trying to fiddle around. So those kind of like glaring errors. I remember once my clicker didn't work as well in a presentation, which was a nightmare. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I've I've developed recently. I've developed a real hatred for PowerPoint. Right. Um, particularly with the kind of online sessions where well you know you're there you're, you're in a box already a small box and everybody else is in a smaller box who's in the room that you're you're training in. now unless it's a webinar which is fine if you've got a hundred and something people in there um or you know that doesn't matter if you've, you're just a box you can't see them anyway but in the more personal sessions with 20 or 30 people you don't want everyone to be in that little box so I've kind of I've gone really against PowerPoint and I, I kind of try and stream my sessions instead and just flash stuff up on the screen. So um, I think I'm kind of now re-dreading going back to face-to-face -face sessions when I have to create the, the PowerPoints again because I won't just be able to flash words up in front of my face and be like, yeah, yeah. hey, cool, let's do this, let's do this. Like, you know, ah, oh, wow, wow, that was cool, you know. Um, <laughs> So yeah, that kind of thing, the technological issues can be difficult. And I think, yeah, the other, the other one is the, you know, the, the main one is the, the time pressure when you need, you need to come up with ideas. If you get that kind of writer's block thing, um, as we talked about, it's, it can be really tricky. Um, yeah. But I think the, the best thing for, for writer's block is, is reading. Um, yeah, it's, there are so, like, you know, I've read, I think we're going to talk in a bit about about books and stuff but i think yeah. one of my big focuses that we'll talk about again is other people's blogs um it's a great place just to to read stuff and like develop ideas not steal definitely not steal but develop um in the same way i hope people develop my ideas when i give a training session i don't yeah. you know, i don't profess to know more than anybody you know i just i have i come up with these fun games these fun ideas these fun activities i'll put them in the hands of other people and quite often i'll get an email like a few weeks later saying i, I used your idea but i did this with it is that okay it's like is that okay that's way <laughs> better than my idea of course that's okay in fact i'm going to reuse that when i next do my session so yeah yeah i think that's one of the biggest but what about you what are some of the difficult things for you Oof, um, I have a few. Um, for me, it's more, I, I suppose, um, the in-service sort of development in terms of observations uh, and the um, taking on the mediator role in, in, in feedback sessions rather than sort of the provider of knowledge. Um, it's sometimes difficult, something that I, that I still find difficult now, feedback sessions, post-observation, especially when there's something negative that's occurred, like some kind of critical incident. Um, it's dealing with that in a way that's 
that the teacher is still okay. There's sort of no loss of face or negative feelings, but they can still see it as sort of a, a development opportunity rather than it's the end of the world. Um, yeah, oh, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I remember when I did my first observations, I had no training whatsoever. Right. And it was no training at all. And I went in there, I was like, that was great. That was great. That was great. That wasn't great. And that was great. I was like, afterwards, I thought that was useless. Like, what, <laughs> on, like what, have I, what have I done? Like, that was utterly terrible. But, you know, I've had some great trainers, Michael Brand, for example, from, from Pierce. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's incredible. And I think I've, I've learned so much from him, particularly in terms of feedback. Um, whenever he gives me feedback, like on, you know, a video or something like that, I'm always there listening closely. And he gave me some feedback the other day. And I was listening. I was, it, was, it, was in a, it was just in a WhatsApp message. You know, yeah. it was a, you know, a bit of personal feedback. Yeah. Um, and I saw it was one minute and three seconds long. And it started out with, I really liked the da 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 and I was just waiting. I was waiting for, there's, there's going to be a button there somewhere. There's going to be a button. There was no button. I was like, oh my gosh, it's amazing. Um, so yeah, I know what you mean. It's like giving feedback, it can be really tricky. Yeah, it can be. Um, and, you know, there are many factors that come into it, um, you know, uh, I was, for example, I was just reading this book, Trainer Development by Tony Wright and Rob Belitha. And they look at sort of the idea that, uh, not only in this book, but there are in other books, for example, advising and support teachers. Um, and, uh, and they look at this idea, you know, everyone's, everyone's different and you really need to see them as an individual um, and understand their, you know, put yourself in their shoes. And, and, and I think also for me, um, especially post-Delta, and a number of the other courses you do, you have this idea of, um, it's like the curse of knowledge, uh, because you know that you know it, it's almost Im implicitly you think everyone else knows it. Um, and and, and that's, that, that, that's a difficult thing sometimes, you know, I remember in my first observations, uh, you know, when I was providing feedback to teachers, even with some of the things I was looking for, I was like, what, that's terrible, why is he not doing that? <laughs> Just basic stuff you know and then you think that i then i reflect on that and i was like no but you know that took me years to learn and 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 you know and, and this teacher's been teaching for for two years you know um and they've Where's come the from the emergent vocabulary on the yeah, board what are you doing <laughs> yeah. where's you know, the pronunciation <laughs> you know so and so that's something that as a, like i would still consider myself a very junior trainer so i've only been doing this for, for three years coming for four years now um and i feel confident in my in my training but there's still things like for example feedback that i that i still reflect on after each time so for example this year i've recorded my feedback sessions with teachers and i'm doing i'm carrying out analysis now it takes a lot air eh? but um it's really insightful to see my questions and things like that um but that 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 would be for me one of the big things is, is the feedback i think um but what about um i oh, so we focus on teacher training uh, and we looked at that quite deeply. Uh, I would see the second part of your sort of you, of who Harry is now is renewable English, um, and and I mean that you know me so well. I, 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 I know you, <laughs> Harry. I know where you live. Uh, oh, that's because I told you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, what were the motivations to? To, to strike out and, and become almost a climate activist and, and, and create a platform that not only makes learners more climate aware, but, but also teachers. What were the motivations behind that? Um, well, I've, I've always been, like, ever since I was young, like my parents were like eco aware, um, um, even before, you know, even before it was big in the news or whatever. I remember when, uh, when in, back in 91, even a long, long, long time ago, um, I was seven. I was almost seven, showing my age there. Um, I was born in 91, so. There you go. Back when you were born. Um, <laughs> but I went to, a, I went to, in the school that I lived in, there was, um, there was suddenly a huge influx of Bangladeshi children. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, like, this is different, you know, as a you know, seven year old kid, this suddenly happens. And my parents, you know, they made me aware that it was because of there, there have been huge floods in Bangladesh and there were these issues. And, you know, there were these people who have been displaced because of that. 
No, it wasn't explicitly explained that it was because of uh, what was called at the time the greenhouse effect. Um, but, uh, you know, floods, obviously, something that are happening more and more and more. But it was something that I was acutely aware of from a young age. So it was always in the back of my mind to to not waste stuff and, you know, not you know, to turn off lights and stuff like that. Mm. Um, but then so when I got sick back in 2011, it was like a um again i've mentioned light bulb moments before i don't want to say it again but it was um so yeah it, it was a life-threatening illness um and i kind of lay there in, in the hospital bed by the way the hospitals in Cordoba are incredible it was like a hotel experience you know i had wi-fi my own bathroom it was like private but it was it was public um i had tv it was amazing um but yeah i was kind of laying there in bed just thinking you know I've been a bit selfish with the way I've treated other people in the world. I've been a bit selfish with the way I've treated the world. I need to change that. Um, so it was that kind of moment then that I realized I needed to do something with myself. Um, then when my daughter was born, it was another kind of kick in the backside, seeing things that the world needed to be a better place. So again, I made sure that within my classes, I would try and do my best. and. I started introducing it to my classes then around 2013. Then in 2016, I worked in a private school that did nothing, like literally nothing. You know, up to, you know, World Earth Day, what they did was print a whole bunch of new pictures on brand new white paper so the kids could color them in and say, happy Earth Day. It's like, what are you doing? This is literally the worst thing in the world. There was no recycling, there was nothing. Um, so with my fifth and sixth grade classes, I, I taught all of the fifth and sixth grade. So that was eight classes. We worked together on a letter to write to the, the head teacher and to the governors demanding that there was recycling in each classroom and there were recycle bins in the playground. Um, not just the ones out the front of school, which were all emptied into the same bin, but they were put there to look nice. Um, and yeah, so seeing the passion within these like students this is back in 2016 2017 mm. and seeing like the collective action that they could make a difference and how like they got into it so this is classes of you know 25 students and, you know a good 10 or 11 of them were really into it and they were really mm. you know believing in it and you know they, we all wrote the letters and, and and something happened from it and you see that yes it's on a very small scale but it's collective action and they're working mm. together for it um, so then when I went to work for, for Pearson, I worked for Pearson for a year. Um, I kept thinking, you know, I want to start this. I want to start this. So at the end of the pandemic, um, I stopped working as an EOT consultant for Pearson. And I went freelance. And I was like, this is the time that it, it needs to be done. While everything was online, while everybody, you know, I was like, this is the time where we can get the message across because the thing that's always really got on my nerves, sorry, using, trying not to use colorful language there. Um, <laughs> and it's something that a lot of um, people within ELT agree with. Um, as you can see by ELT footprint, another thing that really spurred me on and, and encouraged me to do this, to see so many other like-minded individuals was course books had one unit on climate change and whenever I did that unit with my students in class there would be a big sigh and it would be all the terrible things that are happening in the world um, it would be all the extreme weather or the ice caps are melting or there's no water in this faraway place and you know it was all so disconnected and none of it was real and it was all really horrible stuff it was all like this is rubbish and guess what? We're all going to die. And it's like, <laughs> that's, that's not a great way to encourage students, you know. And then they go into their, their FCE exam and maybe they've got a writing about the environment and they write, oh, recycling is amazing. You know, recycling is brilliant. If you recycle, everyone will be fine. They won't. That's a different subject anyway. Um, but you should still recycle. But that's literally the minimum you should do, but definitely still recycle. Anyway, um, so I saw the, the kind of difference that could be made with ELT. ELT is such a, has a global reach. Mm. You know, we're both here in Spain, but, you know, we speak to people every day with the oh. glories, with the marvels of social media, with people across the globe with, you know, 
And if I can get these ideas into the minds of a few, at first it was the idea of students, you know, the idea was to get it into students' ideas, but then I kind of thought, hang on a minute, if I'm making these materials, should it not be for teachers as well? So that's why I've like developed my, my training course for teachers so they can, you know, learn how to do it easier. You know, yeah. that's what the, you know, my talks at, at conferences and stuff are all about just making your classes, making yourself a, a kind of a greener teacher, because yeah. there are so many objections to it. So many objections behind, oh, students don't like it. I don't know enough about it, blah, 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 blah. I'll tell you what, how many people who began um, as backpacker style teachers, like the way I did, how many of us knew what the third conditional was when we went into the classroom? I'll tell you what, I had no idea what the third conditional was. You know, yeah. tell me to give you a past participle and I'd be like, I don't know, is that it? I, you know, I, I had no idea when I started teaching. So that kind of excuse of I don't, I'm not an expert for me doesn't really wash because we're not experts in everything we teach in a syllabus, you know, mm. but we still teach it. Of course, um, yeah. And yeah, so that it kind of all came from that. And now with the second series, which is coming up in September, I've kind of branched out a bit more towards the ideals behind the sustainable development goals right? from the UN. Um, and again, I'm going to try and get that into as many minds and, you know, as possible teachers and students and, just to spread the word and that's that was why I made it free um right. I didn't want I, I do believe you know I do need to make a living with something so the training course isn't completely free obviously um it is a very affordable price um but I like the education side of things the lessons to be completely free because I think it's important that education is free I'm very much a socialist in that respect yeah um and I think these issues these social justice issues these environmental justice issues need to be they need to be everywhere. Like yeah. I've, I've done my on the road workshop with um, five or six different schools and the difference in eco literacy between the different schools is incredible. Yeah, I can imagine. So I did it in, in Italy, I did it in Mexico and I was just like, wow, these kids are amazing. You know, these, these 13, 14 year olds are coming up with questions and ideas and like, how do we get our ideas across to adults? Adults won't listen to us. And then I taught in, a, in a, a village here in Spain. I did my first ever face-to-face -face, uh, renewable English on the road workshop for students. Um, and I went, to, I went into the, the school there and I was like, so guys, hey, how you doing? You know, all the energy in the world. What can we do to help the environment? And one kid was like, well, I, I guess we could recycle. <laughs> and I was like, okay, and, and what else have you got? nothing this kind of eerie silence fell over the room and I was like how many of you guys are a vegetarian silence anyone vegan no I was like how many of you don't eat meat every single day nothing nothing I was like how many of you would consider eating lentils without chorizo and they looked at me like I'd said something about their grandma or something like that <laughs> like, lentils without chorizo looking at me like I was evil I was like <laughs> I was like, guys, I'm not telling you you have to give up meat. What I'm suggesting is maybe you cut down a little bit on your meat because of the huge environmental impact yeah. you know, that it has on the planet. And then you watch the news a few days later and there's the president there saying, well, you're not going to take my steak away from me. No. And it's just like, oh, baby steps, Harry, baby steps. Yeah, there, there are certain things. You know, I, I mean, building on that, just a personal viewpoint, I think a lot of these issues are generational and I, and I hate to say that, but um, let's call it the old guard that, that are still in, in certain positions, if you will. And it's my, my, my own personal viewpoint. And unfortunately, I think we need a lot of people to sort of move on <laughs> politely, I'm going to say it that way. Um, and, uh, but it's, it's, you know, sometimes like even I speak about this with some of my kids sometimes um, and they're aware, like some of them are very, very, very aware. Um, but you can also see the kids that are very heavily, children are heavily influenced by their, their parental figures and, 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 and other family members. 
and you're gonna you can also see the, the, the kids that, that 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 come from families where perhaps the parents have a negative view of you know supporting climate change or climate action and sometimes it's difficult but i think that's where we as teachers really come in and, and we can we can be that positive change in, the, in 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 those in those kids right we can i mean that's that's education we're, we're trying to help them change it in that regard or at least see um perhaps the where they have maybe these espoused beliefs they is so the, they're saying that they believe this but in actual fact they they're doing this it's making yeah. sort of you know that 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 cognitive dissonance almost uh making yeah. them aware of that i mean it's you know it's, it's wonderful to see with, with my daughter who's eight um she's on my top tips videos yeah I've seen. <laughs> you know it's you know that's that's come from my wife and I, obviously, but, you know, mm. she's also part of a, a club, Kids Against Plastic. It's an amazing charity in the UK, mm. which was started um, five years ago by, at the time, a 12-year-old girl and her 10-year-old 10, 10 sister. Wow. You know, and they, they've developed on that. And, you know, the, and, and she goes every, every Saturday, they have a, every other Saturday, sorry, they have a, a connect. And I, I sit in and I, I watch this connect with them and I, I've, you know, I've done some work with them. And it's just amazing to see there's there are these kids from across the world, like from so kind of seven to about 14. And mm. they're all there engaging with each other's ideas and listening to each other. And I just think this is what we need. But the next step is for then the teachers and the, the parents to then listen to the, the students. Yeah, I'm doing a mini series with Renewable English over the summer of mini activists where mm. I'm going to interview four different I'm going to have four different interviews with, with mini activists. Um, and yet what I want to know from them is what do they want to learn? So like yeah. these kids are, they're speaking up already, but, but they know that they don't know everything. Yeah. You know, they're kids. They want to learn from their teachers. What I really want is, you know, for teachers and for adults to kind of go in with that attitude of, I don't already know everything. And yeah. I can learn from my students. Like Definitely. there are so many things you can learn from your students and, mm. And the key step, if you want them to listen to you, like this is something I say to anyone I'm, I'm training as well. If you want your students to listen to you, you've got to listen to them, no matter what it is. You know, if, if a student comes in and says, I've got a wobbly tooth, right? That's amazing. Oh, that's great. Cool. Is the ratoncito Perez, as we have here in Spain, oh, is he going to come and visit you soon? You know, paying an interest. You know, so many times kids come in and they're like, oh, it's my cousin's birthday next week. And as a teacher, you think, great. <laughs> um, it was my cousin's birthday last week. But, you know, it's that. You say it. It was my cousin's birthday last week. Isn't that crazy? You know, having that kind of enthusiasm, but actually listening to them. And I think it works on so many different levels that yeah. um, you need to listen to them if you want them to listen to you. Um, be it about climate, be it about the first conditional. Um <laughs> Be it about Anything. Fortnite. Yeah, listen to them about Fortnite. The amount of times I've had teachers come to me in like a staff room or, or that kind of situation and go, oh, these, these boys, I can't get through to them. All they ever talk about is Fortnite. So it's like, that's your, that's your point there, right? <laughs> you didn't talk about Fortnite. <laughs> there um... you go. Do a class about Fortnite. You know, they, you know, they went away. I, I worked with this, this particular teacher. She was a new teacher. She'd been teaching for about... I don't know, two or three years. So I say a new teacher, fairly, fairly new. And we worked together on devising this lesson plan about Fortnite. She came back after and she was like, it was amazing. They were so engaged. I was like, you know that video of that guy who does that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was that. It was like, of course they were engaged. It's what they wanted to learn about. Listen, mm -hmm. listen to your students. Yeah, I think that's that's another thing, you know, an important role for us trainers to realize. Um you know, it's, it's not always just to provide the ideas, it's to help teachers to say, okay, this is what your students are telling you. What can you, how can you react to that? You know, don't be, don't be afraid to, to move away from the, the syllabus. It's, it's, it's not, you know, this is set in stone. For the majority of us, I know that some, some teachers have a, a very strict syllabus to follow. Um, but that's something that as trainers, I think that we, is our role really, is to really help the teachers see what they can do in their context. Um, Wow. Okay. So we've, you've just thrown so much stuff at me. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that. No, no, no. I have a tendency to do that. No, that's brilliant. Um, I suppose we get to the advice section now. 
Um, and I'd like to, to f focus on two areas. Um, I suppose for, for teacher training um, or, or, or teachers that feel like they'd like to experiment with teacher training or maybe move into teacher training, um, what advice would you have for them? Um, first one, I think, has to be um, give it a try. Write down your ideas. Um, talk to your, like, go. I mean, staff rooms are not exactly a thing at the moment. I know that. Um, but share your ideas with, with your co workers. Right. The, the, for me, the first step to, to teacher training was that, you know, just sharing my ideas with somebody and them saying, that's a really good idea. Like, that's, that's a great idea. Mm. I would love to do that. Um, and that kind of, you know, that, that first step for me is just, you know, talk to someone and share your ideas with them about that. Like, go in there and chat and, you know, see if they're any good, basically, you know, because yeah, yeah. maybe those ideas aren't great and they need to be worked on. You know, mm. maybe, but yeah, if you have a great idea in class, share it and enjoy sharing it. Um, then from there, talk to your academy, ask if you can do a training session at your academy. Mm. Some academies are amazing and you get paid a little bit extra for it. Some academies like tick it off your professional development box. Um, and even if they don't do that, it's a wonderful kind of one of those steps you can take, but also something to put on your CV. You know, mm. if you want to move to another school and you've got it there on your CV, um, I was a teacher trainer. Um, Look for Facebook groups. The, the TEFL Development Hub mm. is, apart from Renewable English, obviously, um, my favourite uh, Facebook group. Oh, sorry, I'm Pearson and uh, BBC Live Classes. That's another one. Um, but no, the <laughs> TEFL Development Hub is amazing. Um, I've got so much from that in the last seven months. Like, you know, I've done a couple of talks there, but there are also so many other talks like every other thursday there's a talk there's a there's a coffee room where everybody gets together and you have like that kind of that that, that chat that you'd have in the staff room um but there's also like they have wednesday questions where they just put out ideas it's got everything and it mm. is just it's brilliant it's everything you could want for development within tefl it's mm. it's got everything there so if you want to be a teacher trainer, have a look there. I mean, I know they're starting tomorrow, um, which won't be tomorrow when this goes out, obviously. So they started a while back. Um, these It's called Speaker's Corner, and it's it's five minutes where someone can go up and do a talk for five minutes, and then they get feedback, and like the idea is developed from there. But like, things like that. Take those first steps, and then from there, do some conferences, man. Yeah. They're awesome. Conferences yeah. are just the best. And I, I really love online conferences. Um, I love them both as a trainer, but also as a participant, just because they are different. They're not the same as a face-to-face -face conference. I love face-to-face -face conferences as well. But I love the kind of, the amount of, the diversity there is, there are so many different options, but also I remember TESOL Spain, um, I did my talk, I was on a high, I was buzzing, so I was like, I'm gonna take the dog for a walk. So I took the dog for a walk, but I could go, I could still go to the sessions. Like, I didn't actively <laughs> participate, but I could listen, I could be involved. I know there are sometimes in the face-to-face -face sessions when, you know, maybe you turn up a bit late and you end up in a session that you don't really wanna be in and, yeah. Not all sessions are amazing. All sessions are very well, tend to be very well thought out and they're normally very well prepared, but sometimes then maybe not to your liking. And yeah. you're kind of, you're then in there for an hour, just like, oh, I'm not sure. And you don't want to be that person who sticks their hand up just to be difficult. So, and you know, you end up sitting there doing your observation thing, writing your feedback. Like, you know, mm -hmm. this is, this is great to give to people in future. Um, so yeah, that go to conferences, speak at conferences, right. um, and also look for these kind of Facebook groups where you have the opportunity. I'm actually starting a training program at the moment, a teacher trainer program on TEFL teachers in Seville, uh -huh. which is for TEFL teachers in Seville. <laughs> um, but if you're not even in Seville, then you know you should come along and join the group, check it yeah. out. And we're doing training sessions. There'll be one every month, but also we're inviting people to kind of send in their proposals. Um, 
So they can go there and they'll have like a, a 40 minute, 45 minute session. But also, you know, I'll talk with them beforehand. We'll have a kind of pre-session talk, what they could talk about. Maybe there are some different ideas they could put in there. Excellent. And then we'll have a feedback session afterwards. It's all completely free of charge. It's just to help develop Tefl. It's amazing. Testing. That's great. Yeah, yeah. That sounds like a great initiative. I'll put I'll make sure to put links down to all of those in in, in the blog post. Um, and I suppose the other area is if if teachers are looking to become more climate aware um and and develop their eco literacy as as, as, you, as you said um obviously i imagine renewable english is, is the site for them to go to it's number I mean, one number Absolutely. one <laughs> <laughs> um do you have any other sources or, or places where they can go or things that they could try yeah um the first stop for me would always be elt footprint the the facebook group um it's just it's amazing mm. um it's helped me so much, so many ideas. And then ELTsustainable.org um, is it's just brilliant. It's, uh, I, I love it. So uh, it's been so much inspiration has come from that. And they have mountains more material than I have, like right. mountains more. Like what I have are specific to the classes, which I've obviously, are obviously recorded as well. So you can take those lessons and give them to, to teachers. There's so there's so much on on those in those two places. Now that for me would be the place to start. Right. Um, there's also a brand new site that's coming out soon called Subject to Climate, which is it's aimed at American schools. So it's like from K1 to K12. Mm -hmm. uh, these these ideas are uh, where they've kind of aggregated loads of different materials from different eco areas so be it from science be it from history be it, and they've kind of they've provided all the links in one place so okay. you can obviously find renewable english on there yeah yeah um <laughs> but yeah that's that's coming out on the first of august so okay quite soon it, it, yeah it might be out already um when this is being viewed uh, i guess um so yeah they're they're three kind of but for me as an EOT teacher, EOT footprint was the best. Right? Was the inspiration behind one of the inspirations behind this. Uh, they, in fact, I put a vote in there of what renewable English should be called, and the vote came out at renewable English. So <laughs> huh? the other options were sustainable English, which was a bit too much like sustain EOT sustainable, right. um, and. Uh, cleaner, greener English. It's just it sounded a bit flowery. So renewable English got the vote. So I have a big thanks to that. Um, and yeah, ELT sustainable, brilliant as well. Brilliant, excellent. Um, the last section of 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 the sponsorship is is always dedicated to, to books. Um, or generally dedicated to books. Uh, do you have any book recommendations for for trainers or for for teachers thinking to becoming more climate aware? Um, I'm going to go for trainers. Um, because for for book for books for climate aware there are a lot but what I've done with most of those books is just kind of for my kind of my own interest behind it okay but yeah for, for trainers I'd the first place for me he is my I'd like to call him a Tefl wizard and we've mentioned him twice already um but anything by by Chris Rowland anything by Chris Rowland they're they're all so good they're so good um the i've been a huge fan of his since i went to watch his, his first session and like he has been a massive inspiration behind a lot of my kind of teacher training um i just i just love like where he comes from his ideas behind it and you know, he's much more in depth with his with his ideas and yeah all, all of his books are great you know the understanding teenage language uh, learners online and mm. understanding teenagers in the LT classroom I know a big issue is with teenagers a lot of the time but he's also got the the structuring structuring fun for young learners I think it's called yeah, yeah. um I think is the name of it so so for me the first port of call it's got to be it's got to be Chris Rowland um otherwise um for, for materials writing, I always go to the how-to books, as you know, you mentioned in last week's chat. They're so good. They're so good. They're so useful. They've helped me so much. Um, and I think as a teacher trainer, a lot of it 
so you know you're coming up with these workshops and these ideas a lot of what you're doing is materials writing yeah you know you're creating these materials maybe you're not publishing them maybe they're not going out there you know with a publisher but I really think it's a good idea to even to take a look at that like yeah. as a kind of source of inspiration and then on top of that if, if you don't want to go out buying reams and reams of books look for blogs like they're they're so accessible they're so easy and there yeah. are there are there are so many out there that you can check um i haven't got a list right now um but i've you know you just need to flick on on linkedin and they'll they'll pop up within your um w- within there like but i think i look at somebody's it seems like a new blog every day um mm. there are just so so many blogs out there I mean, it can be tough um, kind of sifting through them. Um, But I don't know that, be it materials, right? Be it teacher training, they're they're absolutely all over the place. Like there's this brilliant one, Sponge ELT, that you should definitely check out. Uh, Probably probably should check out that one. (laughs) I reckon reckon you should should go on there. But yeah, there's stuff like Lesson Stream and things like that to... To go on there and get those ideas and um just even if it's not specifically about teacher training even if they are kind of lesson plans and and that kind of things to, to get on there and, and have a look at that and i think i did a lot of i've watched a lot of ted talks as well to to kind of help me with my ideas on on how i should be presenting you know just just even watching it and and and, and clicking through it and stuff like that and I find them them really useful to yeah. to help me, you know, improve. Um, you know that EFL magazine is a good one. Yeah, yeah. Um, ELT planning, of course, um, yeah. is Pete Clements. Yeah, he's so he's so good. He's yeah. helped. I've never I've never spoken to him. I've never met him, but I just want him to know how much he's helped me in my TEFL life. He's helped me a lot like an awful lot um yeah i think i think for for many myself included um and uh yeah he's 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 the guy that i always go to i look at oh that's a good idea i'm gonna i'm gonna have a see what it's got in there or he's done a lot of reviews on that book i'm gonna gonna go have a look at that and see yeah yeah Yeah, he's he always he's his blog is one of those ones in fact i'm writing an article at the moment and it's for for some of the stuff i'm going to talk about at the innovate uh conference and and his blog comes up um, as you know one of those examples of what your what a blog could look like you know for for, for materials writers specifically but also for everything yeah um, so I, I would agree with you you know looking at blogs there are some brilliant blogs out there and um, and all, you know so there's plenty of information out there for free yeah um, you know I think it's a good idea to look at those and 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 find those like ELT learning journeys I can't believe I didn't mention the one I actually write on uh, myself <laughs> uh, brilliant those that that if you are a teacher trainer that is for me like a teacher or a teacher trainer that it, it is really good I'm not just saying that because I write blogs for it um that is really good that you know there are blogs from like Michael Brand and Lizzie Beer and there are different teacher trainers ideas on there yeah um so there are all those different viewpoints as well, because that can be, that can be something when you do get a bit like stuck into one person's blog, you do kind of see that viewpoint. Yeah. So I think my my kind of the key really that I've learned over the years, be it a book, be it a blog, it, it's diversify. Don't mm. don't only you know even if you find something that you like, it's good to challenge yourself and look for things that maybe you don't know. Yeah. Um, I remember when I started teaching the books I was reading were, were all like Harmer and Shrivener and people like that, which, which were great. Like they're really nice. They're, there's some really great ideas in there. They're, they're absolute classics, some good ideas in there, but they don't necessarily suit my style of teaching. And, yeah. and when I, when I left the, the academy where I started as a, like doing training, the, the, the director gave me a teaching outside the box thing. Um, and there were just like small ideas in there, like, really cool things like I don't know um what I used quite often when I was teaching um in an academy every now and again I just go in in a suit just and they come in they'd be like you're going to a wedding (laughs) just do something different you know I used to always you know I, I, I wear shirts I like shirts people know I like shirts they're all secondhand but I used to be a sock guy um 
so you know and that was like the idea that i got from this you know do something that's different so when yeah. i worked in a private school it was all shirt and tie and those kind of things so all the teachers had come in and all the teachers were of a um a certain style of person they all yeah. came from um certain styles of families who had already been privately educated certain so they all had, right? yeah exactly they all had the same suit on you know that i don't know if you have it in semana santa there's that kind of everyone walks on the street here in spain in a Kind of dark blue suit they then wear it again for feria which is um, really popular here you know so there was that kind of demographic maybe every now and again a teacher would wear a, a wild tie um <laughs> but i always had these different socks which i'd sometimes wear odd socks as well so i'd walk into the school i'd walk into the classroom and particularly my sort of seven eight year olds they'd you know they'd dive at my feet and pull my trouser leg up and be like what socks are you wearing today you know <laughs> You know, so they've already I had like six, seven year olds who have developed that question. What socks are you wearing today? Right. Then we'd sit there, we'd describe the socks. They you know, would talk about the socks. What socks did you wear yesterday? What socks are you going to wear tomorrow? So yeah. you kind of instead of that weather routine that you often have at the start of class, which becomes a bit kind of dull. Sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry if I've offended every teacher on the planet there. Um, <laughs> It is sunny and hot. It is going to be sunny and hot. It will always be sunny and hot. We live in Seville. Um, it was just something a bit different. And I, and I learned that from, you know, diversifying my reading and not right. just reading those typical things. So, again, yeah. I've gone off on a tangent. It's, it's no, but I like, like how you come back. You, no, that's fine. Don't worry. <laughs> but, uh, no, Harry, it's been uh, an absolute pleasure to speak with you this afternoon um loads of information there loads of advice for, for, for teachers both uh, looking to move into teacher training as well as becoming more um you know eco-friendly in, in a sense in, in their classes and how they can present that to learners so thank you very much for that uh, i won't keep you any longer um uh hopefully well i mean we're going to be at the conferences together but hopefully we actually get to to, to meet sort of face to face in person one of real life conferences they'll be back yeah. soon they'll be back soon i've got both my jabs now so yeah, we'll see how we go. Soon enough. Fingers <laughs> crossed. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a real pleasure. Um, Excellent. Something to very quickly add on the end there. Go for it. Um, for those people who do want to become more eco-literate, just keep trying. If you fail with something, just keep trying. If you're trying to be vegan, don't go all out. Don't, you know, you know, you may have watched Cowspiracy or Seaspiracy or something like that and gone, that's terrible. I don't want to do it anymore. And then you might drop, you might fail. Well, don't worry about it. We all fail. I, I still eat meat from time to time. Um, rarely, but I do still eat meat from time to time. But don't beat yourself up about it. Nobody okay. is perfect, except Greta. Greta's perfect. Come and Greta, speak. Greta, 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 come speak. Come and speak. <laughs> everyone, everyone tell Greta to come and speak to, to me on Renewable English. It would be amazing. <laughs> So yeah, thank you so much. It has been it's been brilliant. I've I've been really looking forward to this for a awesome. long time. Um, I love your chats. Keep them up; they're amazing. Definitely going to mate. Well, cheers, Harry. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah. I'll see you later. Thanks, mate. Bye.